Hello, everybody. I'm Greg Robinson, the Chief Curator at BIMA, and we are here in the Breathe Exhibition. And I'm here to introduce Linda Wolf, and we're going to hear about her work that she photographed in the fall of 2018, the episode in our history that a lot of us have referred to as the caravan. Linda happens to live on Bainbridge Island, but she's a well-known photographer. She has been working in social justice, social journalism. She's well-known in the rock and roll world, and she co-curated our Women in Photography exhibition that we also worked with Amy Sawyer, our associate curator, on a few years ago. So I am going to step off camera so Linda can take off her mask and you can get to know um, Linda and her work better. Thank you, Greg. Linda, when we first started talking about exhibiting your photographs, you sent a multitude, and I was blown away. They were so beautiful, but also difficult to look at. How did you get involved in photographing the caravan in Mexico City? My sister-in-law, Gretchen Kuhner, uh, she has been working for 20-odd years in Mexico City with women and families in migration. So she's a lawyer and has a nonprofit organization that uh, does a lot of work in this subject. I had been very upset with the situation for a long time about immigration in the United States. And this was a particularly hard year, 2018, and became a very famous caravan. There have been many caravans prior to this. this these are pictures of the caravan immigrants that came to Mexico City, leaving Honduras, walking. Um, or catching rides in trucks or whatever, with their families stopping in Mexico City, and then they were on their way to the Tijuana border. Well, Gretchen, I I'd have been asking her questions for years about the caravans and about the people and what we were being told. And she would give me the true stories and more of the history behind why so many people are leaving Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, I learned about our political situation, how we had been involved in the, in the politics of those countries. It was a, a tremendous education. And she let me know that this caravan was going to be stopping in Mexico City and that if I wanted to photograph, I should get ready because they're going to arrive soon. And she ended up calling me on, I think, a Tuesday and said, get here by Saturday and you'll be able to photograph prior to the international press coming because they're starting to arrive on Saturday. So I packed my bags and went. And where exactly in Mexico City did they arrive? They were being welcomed to a stadium inside Mexico City where they were given mobile dental units, food, medicine, where they could take showers, um, where they could have respite along the way on the march toward Tijuana, which is where they were going to request asylum in the United States. And it was also an opportunity for the Mexican government to say, if you want to stay in Mexico, you can, and we'll help you find jobs, we'll help you find housing, we'll, we'll support you, which is what Gretchen's organization was there to do. There were many organizations uh, that arrived bringing trunk loads of clothes and shoes and toys and everything to give away. I mean, it was an unusual event in the history of the caravans from northern Central America. I remember reading your summary about how this particular group got started with 100 people in Honduras, and then by the next day it grows to 1,000. They're joined by many people from other countries, and by the time they get to Mexico City, it's several thousand. I look at your photographs, and these aren't the drug dealers and rapists and murderers that were referred to in, with the whole political football going on with the election season. I'm just wondering, what was your impression? Who, who are these people that you met? Right. Well, it was approximately 7,000, they think, that actually arrived in this 2018 caravan. So it was a lot more than anybody expected. Um, I knew prior to coming, because of my sister-in-law, Gretchen, telling me there's no point in a gang member walking with a caravan to the United States. They, ha they don't need to financially, and they wouldn't be doing it in the first place. So I knew politically this was, as you say, a political football. 
And it was being used to disrupt the midterm elections that were coming, where the Democrats were going to then bring in lots of legislators. And, and there was an attempt to stop that by blaming the Democrats for this, this caravan coming in, or for the policies that, that the Democrats held. And you mentioned that the caravans have been coming for a long time. And here we are in April 2021, and they're still coming. It's a big issue for the Biden administration also. And their destination is the United States. Linda, why are these people so intent on getting into the United States? Well, first of all, these are the poorest of the poor. One of the people that I've interviewed, Bartolomon Fuentes, he speaks in the interview, which you know we have up on the wall, about how it's maybe now 80% of the people in Honduras are impoverished. And between poverty going on for so long and political corruption that's been going on for so long, as well as climate change, which has now devastated with hurricanes these areas, people are desperate and they're starving and they want to get out to some place where they can have some opportunity to eat and survive. I appreciated being able to have the group Zoom conversation with Gretchen in Mexico City. And I remember when she said it wasn't so much about getting in as much as it was about getting out. That's right. It's about getting out. You mentioned climate change, and you've also talked about the droughts that followed the hurricanes and then people moving from the more rural areas to more urban areas and what happens then with gangs and young women being kidnapped. Well, there's been, I think, 200 bodies returned at least to Honduras from the path to the United States because kidnappers would come at various points along the way and, and kidnap people and try to get people into gangs. And they even have this issue when, when they arrive in the United States as well. Some young men that I know in particular, um, one of whom is, is also in an interview here, he, he told me recently that he's had to go into hiding in the United States because of folks in the, in, from gangs in the United States that are threatening to hurt his family back in Honduras if he doesn't join a gang in the United States. So this is going on. These photographs aren't ends in themselves. They're portals to look into the lives of the people who really are on the caravans. But not to stop here, but because their lives are going on, whether they made it to the United States or whether they were sent back to their country of origin. The stories of their lives are important to know as they've progressed. The panorama you printed is quite complicated and really powerful, but I realize now that it's only just one glimpse of all the people that were being housed here. And only one tent of four tents, each filled. And then the stadium filled in the bleachers and uh, outside of the bleachers and in the front of the stadium in the park. Uh, people set themselves up wherever they could find a place, but each one you can see has been supported by the Mexican government at the time, especially in Mexico City. The, everyone was given something to sleep on, some form of blanket if they needed one, food galore, and as I said, medicine and physical care. And the children were given movies and clowns were brought in. And this was an extraordinary moment. And as Gretchen can tell you, something that happened because the government was shifting at that moment. And there was this gap that allowed this welcoming in. Of course, those who did get to go on to Tijuana, which is most of them, you know, that was where they were, they were tear gassed and where things got worse. How long were they at the stadium in Mexico City? Stadium. They stayed here for about five days, and then they were actually given a metro. Like, the metro was emptied for them to get on, to get as far as they could go on the metro to then begin their walk again. 
it's almost like you're not even there as the photographer. So you must establish a comfort level in order to achieve the work that you do with these people. And the other is that the work has a, a real grittiness. It feels so real. The, there's a saturation of ink on the paper. It almost feels like charcoal. Tell us a little bit about your equipment or techniques. This particular group of people wanted to be photographed. It's not always easy to go into the street and just photograph people, especially now that there are cameras everywhere and everybody's photographing everybody. When I started, you know, in 1960s, I was unique as a young woman photographer traveling in the world. Uh, so that was different. But now people are more private because they're getting um, inundated. But this particular group of people was uh, desperate to be photographed. They were coming to anyone with a camera and saying, talk to me, tell, you know, photograph me, to photograph my children. They wanted to be seen. They weren't ignorant of what was being said about them. And some of them just were just happy to be the focus of anything. Uh, also, I, you know, being a woman, photographer has afforded me a lot more intimacy with women in particular. They feel safer with another woman. There's a simpatico because I'm a woman. As far as my processes, it's only been in the last 10 years that I've printed digitally. I'm just doing it by feel. And to me, these types of photographs, most of which were taken digitally in color, were transformed into black and white. As an original negative positive photographer, um, it was always black and white. So black and white's just been the way I see. My style is black and white. And, and then my style is to augment the people, the faces, the eyes, to get into who is this person and what are they, they saying? with who they are, in their spirit. Everything is non-cropped. It's the way I shot it, but I might darken this area so that I can bring out the person. And I think that that's the most important part. Like this, this, this was dark, but to bring out the people, because that's who I'm expressing. I'm expressing my feelings and who they are as best I can. I really appreciate how you wanted the work to be presented in the most basic and minimal of ways, allowing us to use very spare frames and even letting us um, pound nails into your beautiful panorama. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I do believe that what's precious here is the relationship that people will have with the people in each frame. And that's more important to me than to try to make the piece itself, this particular body of work, precious. These people are precious. And what's precious is the relationship that others can have with them. And then to develop more of an understanding of, well, what is going on here? Who are these people? Where are they today, two years, three years later? And not all the stories are pretty. In fact, most of the stories aren't so pretty. Some of the stories are successful, and others are, are, are tragic. What comes to mind is a sign that I saw on someone's window, which is, say their names. And what I want to remind everyone is that we're in a long process in this country, not just with um, immigrants, but with people who have lived here all their lives, whose families have lived here all their lives. And we all need to um, recognize that and continue to struggle for um, a just, compassionate, wholesome, healthy uh, world, um, socially, environmentally, and um, Linda, what's going on in my mind right now is just how many issues we have to grapple with and resolve on this planet Earth today. It's, there's the institutional racism, the immigration issues that you're bringing forward here. Everything at once, it's, um, it's necessary but kind of overwhelming, and I just hope we can find a way where everyone can stick together and not try to divide and conquer. Where, 
we're strongest and safest together. Well, what comes to mind is John Lennon saying, you know, come together right now over me. Linda, thank you for being part of our Breathe exhibition in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. With all the issues and horrors that have been happening, especially in 2020, BEMA didn't want to go into 2021 without finding a way to acknowledge it. And I really appreciate that you've brought the realities of the caravan forward to be included in our exhibition. Thank you.